Hi, I'm Tina Olke, and I'm your instructor for Psych 155. And we're going to start out today by talking about the basics or the foundation of psychology. We're going to cover um, just the beginning of psychology and then talk about some of the founders of psychology. I've been told before that um, learning about some of the founders can be a bit confusing, and I can certainly understand about it because the foundations of psychology a long time ago and it's hard to relate to some of them so hopefully uh, by the end of this mini lesson you'll be able to uh, get a better understanding about some of the foundations and some of who uh, the grandfathers of psychology are and be able to relate to them a little bit better uh, to begin with what is psychology but psychology is really not only digging deep and analyzing what goes on in your mind but it also talks about behaviors as well so it talks about what comes into your head and what is out produced into your behavior. So it's a combination of both mental and physical manifestations as well. So I think that by the time that we'll end up through the, the course, that you'll be able to see uh, just how everything is connected in through your mind and out through your body. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is structuralism. That's where psychology really started. It's only about 130 years old. It's amazing that psychology is only that old. Um, what structuralists really did when they started out is they analyzed everything that was in your senses, your images and your feelings. For example, if I were to hold up an apple and I might break down and bite into this apple, a structuralist would come unto me and say, tell me what that tasted like, what that smelled like, what, what did your senses produce in that? Well, the problem is, is that if I ate this apple and you ate this apple, we might come up with two totally different things. So there is no way to be able to generalize and to, to make connections between the two. So it really died out around the 1900s uh, because it was too individualized. One person experienced different things than the next person experienced. The grandfathers of structuralism was William Wundt. And William Wundt started a uh, laboratory in about 1879 in Germany. And he was really known as the father of psychology. Initially though, let me tell you something about William Wundt. He wasn't a very good student at all. In fact, he dropped out of high school. One teacher suggested that he uh, get a career in the Postal Service. Can you imagine our grandfather of psychology delivering mail? He didn't stop there. He actually got carried through and uh, gained his degree and he developed uh, the technique of introspection, which means that you look at um, things objectively, you examine them, and you measure your thoughts and your mental activities. He had this laboratory that I was telling you about earlier where he had people come in and he had them do experiments, sometimes as many as 10,000 times where they analyze their internal observations. Now William Tensioner, the bottom, the guy on the bottom, was his student and he brought structuralism to America. And so he crossed the ocean and brought it over to us. At the same time that structuralism was happening in Germany, a man named William James was coming up with a scientific approach called functionalism in America. Now functionalism describes the function of how people adapt, live, work, and play. So what does that all mean? It's, it means that where structuralists uh, really analyze things about the inner workings, the functionalists want to know how and why of different behaviors. So where Wundt was known as the father of psychology, William James is known as the father of American psychology. Now, functionalism was also short-lived. However, you can see parts of it in educational psychology, evolutionary psychology, and industrial and organizational psychology. Now, a different type of psychology is called Gestalt psychology, which is a really good word on the tip of your tongue. Gestalt psychology started in Germany as well. It started with this guy named Werthmer, who studied sensation and perception. Now, Gestalt psychologists uh, really believe that the present moment, the here and now, is more important than anything else, than even understanding why. So it really focuses on the present awareness rather than analyzing anything. 
Gestalt ideas are uh, grounded in cognitive psychology, and as you can tell by the word cognitive, that means in your mind. That focuses on your perception, it focuses on learning, on memory, thought processes, problem solving. So it's really focusing on your mind and what's happening in your mind and not anything analyzing any behaviors. Now, in Austria, Freud was coming about. Maybe you've heard of him, Sigmund Freud. He was, Freud was very, uh, was uh, born in the former Czech Republic and then he moved to Austria. While he was very smart, it did take him eight years to get through med school because he was interested in so many different things. He first studied to become a neurologist, but um, he unfortunately ran out of money, so he became a medical doctor instead. He was considered one of the pioneer of his field because he uh, started to treat what was called hysterical women, and we would consider them um, women with anxiety disorders today. Now Freud is extremely controversial because what he thought uh, that was wrong with a person or what a person was going through was all rooted back to their childhood. So he proposed that uh, people had things that uh, were back into their unconscious and that you were unaware of things and that maybe that related back to your childhood. Now in his, he had this therapy practice that's called psychoanalysis. And he, what he would do is he would have see people sit down and usually they would lay down on a couch in his day and time and he would tell them everything that was on their mind. And then Freud would sit there and he would look for hidden meaning. For example, if I would come in today uh, to his practice and say, man, I had cereal today and I am really tired of it. Freud might then explore if, if there was a time in my childhood uh, well, I felt forced to continue in something that I did not want to. And maybe I was repressing a resentment toward my mother who really told me no all the time. And that cereal stood for all those things that I could not do. As you can see, Freud really believed in the unconscious and that there is so much underneath the surface that we are unaware of. He felt that if you can uh, uncover those traumatic things, then you can really free yourself and you can heal. Now behaviorism. Behaviorism is a field of psychology that we still see today. It, its premise is that the behaviors are only the things that, that we want to focus on. It's the only the observable behaviors that are important only things that are seen and measured. So everything that's in your unconscious, everything that's bothering you under the surface, doesn't matter, not at all. It's only your behaviors, only what you can see. There is nothing hidden, there is no deeper meaner, meaning it is only what's seen and directly measured. Now a guy named John Watson was practicing a form of therapy called behaviorism in the United States. And John Watson, he's also very controversial. He was a famous practitioner who was a professor at John Hopkins University, and he was a recognized authority on babies. He was controversial for his experiment called Little Albert. Maybe you've heard of it. Watson believed that he could teach people to fear. So what he did is he got this eight-month-old baby whom he gave the name Albert, who the, at first the baby wasn't scared of anything. And then Watson would hit the still bar uh, behind the baby whenever a little white rat would come near the baby. And pretty much the, the baby would get scared of it after that and it would start to cry. Watson introduced other things and uh, that were white, like a Santa Claus a mask and, and a furry rabbit, and he taught the baby to fear anything white and furry. We'll learn more about Watson later on. Now we're moving into the modern perspectives. So these are the ones that are currently being practiced. The first perspective is the psychodynamic perspective. This one is a modern form of psychoanalysis perspective, which was who? That's right, Freud. It focuses on the development of self and the motives behind a person's behavior. Unlike when Freud first uh, developed psychoanalysis, it, the behavior and the basis behind of it isn't really sexual or blaming anything in your childhood. Rather, that there are, it believes that there are unconscious motives behind behaviors uh, that need to be further explored. And the behavioral 
X perspective, remember Watson was connected to it, is now updated with a man named B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner studies something called the operant conditioning. He believed that psychology is something that's very scientific. We can look at it, we can measure it, we can record it, we can study it. And he's famous for something called Skinner's Box. We're going to study that again later on this, this, uh, this course period, so we'll get into it. Now, behaviorism is used still today. Remember, it's used for ADHD, OCD, and to help people lose weight. Now, humanistic perspective is more rooted uh, in philosophy than in actual practice. It, it, what it does is it aims to help people answer the big questions like how and why and what's the meaning of free will and how do you choose things. Founders of, of the humanistic perspectives are mans like Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. Uh, this is Carl Rogers uh, here on the slide. The humanistic perspective it emphasize, emphasizes that the human potential, we, we have an ability inside of us to become the best person that we could actually believe, uh, be. Now the cognitive perspective, cognitive again is right inside the mind so it focuses on memory, intelligence, a perception on learning, a lot about learning. And we're going to go into a lot of depth, we'll, spend, we'll actually camp there for quite a while. And the sociocultural perspective, that's where it looks on um, how, your, how you fit into social behavior and the culture in around you. The biopsychosocial per, uh, perspective um, talks about what is going on with your body uh, in with different behaviors. So it talks about in genetics, uh, hormones, the activity of the nervous system. And then last but not least is the evolutionary perspective. And that looks at uh, different characteristics that all humans shared. And how, it sees our uh, behavior as more of an adaptive kind of survival um, value. So this concludes what we'll be covering on our PowerPoint mini lesson. The Reflective Log Assignment asks you to um, take a look at the, what we've learned and what you've read and suggest ideas for future ref, uh, research uh, designed to advance the knowledge or concepts learned in the chapter. Or maybe you can uh, take a look at what's on the internet for now and find ideas that are related to what you've learned in chapter one and maybe apply it and tell me about it a little bit. The idea of the reflection log is a conversation between you and me where you process the information you learned. Maybe you can ask me questions, maybe you can tell me what struck out about you, or maybe you can simply discuss what you've learned. Don't use it as an opportunity to summarize a chapter, but rather reflect on it and share your thoughts and feelings and, and reflections with me. There are a lot of ideas out there in chapter one that you can reflect on, and I can't wait to hear what you come up with.